Hey guys, Infidel1258 here. Today I want to do another Frequently Asked Questions video. We're going to get into the comment section. We're going to answer three of the questions that you guys have left on my previous videos. If you're new to my channel, we do this regularly. My name is Dwayne Cunningham. I go by Infidel1258 and you can just call me 12. If you leave comments on any video, I go through regularly. And if I answer your questions, I'd love to send a thank you. So make sure you're leaving in that IGN. But uh, we'll go, we'll grab one comment from one video, move on, grab one comment from one video, doing three separate videos, three separate comments. And then, uh, yeah, hopefully it's entertaining and fun for you guys to enjoy. Like I said, if you're new, we cover Splinter Lines regularly. I'd say every single day, but we also cover other blockchain based video games. This, this game has really changed my life financially. And I truly believe that's possible for other people too. So if that sounds interesting, stick around, stay tuned, like, and subscribe. I have not looked at the comment section yet, so I don't know what we're getting into. And I have to say also, before we go any further, I've got some new audio in the background. We're enjoying some um, some Spotify creative creative mix. It should be non-copyright. And my fingers are crossed that it's truly not copyright. Uh, we'll see. I've been getting dinged regularly, which is frustrating because it just takes away some of the, you know, relatively trivial financial opportunity that I get from creating this content. And it's a lot of work. So one, I appreciate all of you guys who support the channel, who have supported the channel for some time, who are giving three bucks or more to support what we do here. Thank you. And if you're interested in more content from me, as well as live only access, as well as members only content, check out the membership page and see what sort of tier you might be interested in subscribing at, because there's a lot of extra content that they get that you won't. Thanks guys. Okay, let's see. We'll get, looks like the comments on Rebellion. That one was kind of a successful video. Let's see what the views are like. I've got a ton of content guys coming out this week. I am in Florida next week. I'll be at Disney World with my family having an amazing time i'll try to post photos so you guys can see what's up but uh, i won't be recording a ton of content there hopefully some because it's a different setting and it'll be it'll be things that i want to talk about and share but as you can see i've queued up a ton of content so we're ready to cover you even when i'm not here recently i did this video 720 20, 22 views on the rebellion is coming in 2023 50 comments 50 guys that's a lot 97.1 likes likes you guys are a fan of rebellion i guess i'm a fan of that it's coming and i give i think reasonable justifications for why we should be excited but obviously you can never you know appease everybody somebody's frustrated with that video maybe because they feel we should wait maybe 2023 feels too soon one of the criticisms criticisms i expect from the community we'll see what the comment section says but one of the criticisms i'm expecting is that it's too soon. I don't have money yet. I have no dry powder. Wait, wait, wait. Let's see bull market and then release a pack. That might be a, criti a critique we hear in the comments. Let's find out together. I do address that in the video and uh, we'll see what happens here. Let's grab Topher's comment because he, he's the first and also he's got the sort of, there's, a, there's some meat on the bones here. He goes, I think the launch of Rebellion will be a big deal for both the company in terms of revenue, but also as a gauge of the market health and sentiment. Yeah, that seems true and fair. I personally would have a, have a hard time buying, say, four dollar Rebellion packs when Chaos Legion packs are currently going for a buck twenty, and the average Chaos pack card value is about a buck. Hmm. I hear you. I get that. Let's go on. On one hand, the company needs revenue, but on the other hand, their latest set isn't really holding value, or is very much at a discount depending on how you look at it. That's. A, I like the framing you gave there, Topher. That's. This is a well balanced comment thank you for that there's this is kind of how i try to think about things it's like that you know you you articulate the the fact that it truly it's not holding chaos legion is not holding its value is one sort of view or the alternative which is i think justifiable or it's at a discount and that is almost a, a point of perspective it's like are you asking the question in september 2023 are you are you willing to wait until september 2024 and then what will the answer be then there's going to be a different perspective for those different timelines and those different um you know those paths those different paths forward okay so i think splinterlands needs to be conservative in their pricing and also use the time to burning me mechanism for say each tranche of one million packs to one make money for the game but also reassure players that what they're buying will also be proportionally limited to demand okay there's so much fun here i'm excited about this comment thank you tover and like I said earlier, guys, leave your IGNs. I've been saying that repeatedly, and I don't know if you guys are, you know, 
trying to be altruistic and you're not looking for the re returns, but I'd love to say thank you in a, in a sense. And more recently, I offered to give away a plot of land and my, my friend didn't give his IGN and I have, haven't been able to track him down. So, um, I know I'm going to be giving away a plot of land probably after late September when I return from, from Disney world. But yeah, I need IGN so I can say thank you. And this is a great comment because there's just so much to it. And there's real nuance to it. You're, you're potentially being critical of card values holding up. You're also being thoughtful about the team needing money. You're also being, you know, reconciling or wrestling with the reality that people don't necessarily have money to roll. And maybe they're going to be apprehensive when Chaos Legion or even Rift Watchers have lost value. It's all, of, it's a great comment. So you, you start off by saying you'd, you'd have a hard time buying $4 Rebellion packs. And I think $4 is an interesting suggestion by you. I, I've heard other people say $4. I saw Walking Keys talking with, was it After Sound and Darkest Night, I think. And they were talking about maybe $4 Rebellion packs. I don't know if that's been declared or shared by the team. I don't think it has. I think that's just speculation at this moment. But I think that's probably in the right ballpark. And I suspect it's truly going to be like a $5 price tag with like a dollar premium or sorry, dollar discount available if you're using vouchers and i did hear keys and, and the boys talking about voucher use in this i think we have to use vouchers in this but like walking keys said this is really smart this is his idea not mine plunderlands has to decide what the number is that they want for each pack if they feel they need four dollars per pack they need to they need to say it's a five dollar pack and then give you a dollar discount when you use vouchers it can't be we need five bucks per unit, but we're willing to take a, a loss and, and give away, you know, essentially accept vouchers. Truly a $5 pack with a, with a willingness to accept four bucks on it per unit makes sense to me, probably from a price perspective for the team, as well as where the game is at and the economy. I think that number makes sense. I'm not saying I love $4. I'm, I, if some of you are going to hear $4. Dwayne loves $4. He thinks it's a great price or five bucks and with a discount. It's more like the thoughtful position of the team needs income. They create the assets. They set the prices. We know that five bucks has been roughly the price. Four bucks, you know, is kind of what we're paying for Rift Watchers, like, uh, you know, based on discounts with EEC, etc. I think that makes sense. I'm not saying I love it. I would love cheaper because I would get more of them. But the thing is, we, a lot of us want the cards to be a limited in number. We don't want 15 million packs again. That didn't work very well with Chaos Legion. I think one day in the future, we will we will feel that Chaos Legion was issued appropriately, that 15 made sense, and the 12 and a half or whatever that we ended up selling will be okay. But for now, obviously the prices have fallen because that supply was greater than we truly could soak up in 2022 and before that. Now, in 2024, 2025, things will be different and the demand will grow, I think, and you might disagree, but I think. And so I'm saying $4 for a rebellion pack makes a lot of sense. And I like it, some sort of discount with a voucher just because vouchers need to have sort of that ongoing utility and that needs to grow, not get less. Otherwise, vouchers mean like nothing. Well, what I, I did hear, I saw, I read in the comments, I think Virus said this in the, in the live with um, keys and such. And he was saying, no, this was People's Guild, shout out to People's Guild. They were talking about how they, I, I think they have some sort of inside scoop about how Hardpoint has some sort of big utility coming for vouchers and it was hush hush. So I don't know what that is. I don't have any background information. I haven't spoken to the People's Guild. I just saw a comment pop up on Walking Keys Live alleging that. Now I like People's Guild and I trust them and they've spoken to these people. So I kind of think that's probably legit. Maybe they know more than they're letting on. If you're friends with them, I recommend you poke those, uh, you know, poke mine for more information there. But I'm saying I suspect vouchers have a have a role in rebellion. I suspect a five dollar price point and a four dollars after discount situation, you know. And then you get into Chaos Legion how they're not holding value. Uh, you didn't, it's true. It's like I said though. I think one day we will look back, and I've said this for a while, and and so far it's been untrue. So take this with a grain of salt. But I believe one day we will look back and say dollar for Chaos Legion packs is so ludicrous. I think we're gonna, truly going to get to a place where one day they'll have a, a far higher value. I think the packs themselves, I think the cards within, I think the rental values associated because growth in the player base as well as demand from things like land, etc. Maybe I'm wrong, but that's my vision for the future with this. So I would be in the camp of the second part where you talk about maybe the, the chaos packs are, uh, what did you say? How did you frame it? They're very much at a discount. That's, a, that's more my view. And then lastly, you talk about how the timed mechanism for burning packs. I think this is 100% needs to happen. And we've we've talked about this for a while. In fact, I you know, 
I'm pretty sure aggro is even, and I'm pretty sure Matt have said that this is what they want to do. And it's going to be that sort of more nine month window. They're available for nine months, three months off, three months on or nine months on something like that. We haven't heard that clearly articulated recently, nor have we heard definitive, you know, if we launch in November, we're going for nine months. No one has said that with such clarity and we would love to hear that. So we can ask these questions at the town halls and the town squares. Uh, you know, we should. Let's let's mine for these informations instead of keep you know asking when land or when moon or whatever the same questions we keep throwing at these guys. <coughs> so we definitely have to. I mean, this is a huge priority. We need to have this burn mechanism, this time-based elimination of packs. And I agree that what it essentially does is it 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 lets the players be reassured that what they're buying will be proportionally limited to demand. I would say it, it's slightly different. I would say it reassures the player in the context of, I believe this has, you know, X value. Value being its utility, its future price, the, you know, the functionality. It's a just and logical investment. The value is what you're getting. You're, and, and you think the value is high. That's why you buy something. You think the price is low. Sometimes that's why you buy something. But something in between, you think the, the price is right and the value is high. That's, that's usually why you're buying these packs. And I would argue that when you buy them early on, you're doing so with an educated guess about how well they will sell. And you, if there's 5 million rebellion packs or 10 or whatever number there is to start with, you might think, well, four bucks a pack after I use voucher discounts, if there's 10 million packs, maybe they will truly sell that. 5 million, I think we crush. 10 million, I think we have a hard time with. But burning mechanisms changes the whole scenario. You could throw out 10, see if they sell. And then if you're one of the early buyers for a rebellion that has theoretically 10 million packs, understand that you personally benefit if less sell. Why? If 10 million is the starting amount of packs that are available for rebellion, and if you buy whatever number of packs you want from that release, and if some of those packs for that you acquire are strictly investment long-term hold, recognize that if some of them burn because of this tranche window you're talking about, then not every 1 million, you know, we burn, we burn a certain amount as time goes on, I would say. It's, I would say, you know, you can even start the burn right away and know that every day some are disappearing. I don't know why that, you know, it seems plausible to me, or you could start the burn at like six months and then they burn until nine months and then they're all gone. Something like that, maybe. It doesn't matter as long as they're, the supply is diminishing, the people who do buy are actually getting a greater value than they first thought because you bought it when you thought there was going to be 10 million packs, let's say. And then there end up being seven, you actually got a one in seven million asset as opposed to a one in 10 million. And so the scarcity has gone, the scarcity has gotten better if they burn. And therefore my argument is the resource or the asset you've purchased, its value has gone up, even if the price hasn't. We look at Chaos Legion similarly, we deleted about two and a half million, I think. And, and you might say, well, look, Dwayne, you're wrong because look, the price of Chaos Legion has gone below where it was before we burnt those. Therefore, you're wrong. The, the, the scarcity doesn't have, it does not have anything to do with the price. Wrong. On a, on a long enough time horizon, scarcity always impacts price. Free market conditions mean it's this simple, guys. The amount of supply compared to the existing demand and that establishes a price point. The price on Chaos Legion has been dropping because there is still ample supply, but that is fixed now. In fact, it's lowering and the demand has diminished. That's primarily why the price of Chaos Legion has currently fallen to what I would call a discount, like we said earlier with Topher here. So the question you need to ask with Chaos Legion or Rebellion or Rift Watchers is, do we think that the existing demand is going to be the last demand or do we expect demand to grow up or go down? Those are the three different questions all around demand that you actually can wrestle with. And if you come to a place where you think Chaos Legion or Rift Watchers or Rebellion in the future is going to have a growth of demand because perhaps you think the game will grow in player base, then you might articulate an argument that I would share, which is the price will go up when that player base grows or when that demand grows. And sometimes it's not just player base it's also things like draft mode tournaments that cause new buying pressure on these assets or it's you know 
new battle modes that create new desirability land 1.5 which has a new sort of sync for card use use etc so there's different ways you can increase demand either from our existing player base or adding to the player base and so the question really at the core is demand versus supply supply is capped in fact it's shrinking demand is probably low because we got rift watchers and people it's being burned so people are wanting to get in there rather than come back to chaos legion but that will these things are in they operate in waves we're not done with chaos legion there will be growth in its price point as long as this game st stays here and is here to stay the price on chaos legion isn't done and i would argue the same factors will unfold with rebellion when that comes it's going to be it'll launch at one price it'll it'll saturate the market people who want it will will satisfy their their current desires the price point on the peer-to-peer -peer market will drop below the sale value through splinterlands and we'll burn some of the packs and then the the, Re the rebellion will go out of up, um, out of production and once those packs are finite you should to burn through the supply that's left on the shelves both on the peer-to-peer -peer market as well as those remaining within splinterlands if that's if there are any remaining with splinterlands and then um and then you start to get to a place where supply has finished and demand even if moderate can still drive prices high. That's my vision for Rebellion. That's my vision for, I guess, all of the packs, to be honest. But 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 in terms of how they need to handle it and, and that it absolutely is important that we move forward with Rebellion, I'm glad that I'm seeing at least Topher here. And I, I, there must be some salty ones in here too. Otherwise, there wouldn't be 50 comments. But Topher agrees that we should launch. He just feels we could keep it four bucks. And, and he's. it sounds like he's a little nervous about maybe the price falling lower. But I think... The one thing you got to remember is it's not just if you buy it for four bucks, it's not just does the pack stay at four dollar value. It's actually also a question of does Rebellion transform how you're able to earn with the game, maybe with allowing you to win more rank battles or allowing you to win more tournaments or allowing you to win more guild brawls or maybe to win more in Splinter Forge, etc. So the pack creates a utility that you unlock. And then does that augment maybe some of the price reduction that is probable when a new pack releases and starts to saturate the market thanks tofer for the great comment appreciate you i'm sure there's some salties in here but uh i want to move on to another video although i want to say sh shout out to saucy j couldn't agree more we should see shouldn't we shouldn't see much price appreciation until the end of in of an influx of new users in web3 gaming sector yeah i would say that that I would add that just tack on to my prior comment with, with Topher, the idea that the greatest growth available to Splinterlands assets will come when the new user base really dramatically moves. That's absolutely, absolutely true. It's not the only path to price growth, but it's absolutely one of the most likely paths. Okay, Mitch, I oh, appreciate you, Mitch. Mitch is Golden Skeeter and he goes, he's talking about, this is a video I talked about with three different things. It was another FAQ question uh, video. We talked about SPS farming will not be profitable. We talked about card combinations with the the new C Rec legendary, and we talked about Splinterlands having a fiduciary duty to um, to maximize their existing financial runway. Okay, what did Mitch? What do you guys say here? Mitch says regarding the last section, if everyone farms grain, okay, so this is the he's talking specifically about SPS farming will not be profitable. That's what we talk about in the video. And I think it's probably true. It, I think it's probably true. Let's see what Mitch thinks. Regarding the last section, if everyone farms grain and then holds it until we can sell it on the marketplace, then there should be an oversupply of grain in the first few months. Yes, I agree. And the price of grain could be super low and could be a good time to stockpile before it increases once land 2.0 launches. I think this is really smart. And all this seems like a really simple question or comment. I think there's a lot of depth here because one, you're saying you're saying, you're pointing out, the, you're actually talking about the supply demand thing I mentioned in the previous comment, except for with respect to grain. You're saying that there might be a path through what land 1.5 when it launches that many people or even most people will focus on grain production because it's really low risk. If you farm grain, you can pay your monsters, feed your monsters. And, and whereas if you farm SPS, you actually need X amount of grain to support those monsters or you have to buy it and that would be a financial loss at current SPS prices. So there's more risk associated with farming SPS unless you know what you're doing or farming resource credits unless you know what you're doing. Um, farming grain, you could throw every one of your plots of land at grain 
feed your monsters and be happy to be producing a resource that you can stockpile. And then like we said in the video, you can at least for now, when during 1.5, you'll be able to stack as much grain as you want on that plot of land. But eventually in the future, you'll need a building to hold that grain. So it feels like it makes sense to stack grain. Now, but Mitch's point is very, you know, it's, it's thinking two steps ahead. He's saying, look, if that's the trend that we're expecting, why not get ahead of it or imagine like prepare to react to the most likely path I, again, the most likely path is many people creating lots of grain because it's easy, it's safe, and there's not sort of a, there's a lack of calculation or complexity to that pr approach. If that happens, and if most people produce grain, then there should be an oversupply. And when it's tradable, he's right, you should be able to buy it for super low and then stockpile yours, like fill up your, your coffers with grain that you're going to want for the future. Pretty smart. Even if you ultimately take the grain approach on day one with your land, I would argue argue he's probably right and you might want more grain when 1.6 or 2.0 or whichever whichever addition is going to release that sort of grain trading market where you're actually going to be able to sell your grain. We probably need to have some DEC ready for that time because probably you're never going to have enough grain. That's that's probably true like for long term. And even if you do have a big stockpile of grain, then you can just, you'll manipulate your plots of land so that you're then able to produce some SPS or some research, etc. So I think long-term, you never have enough grain. So even if you're just cognizant of the fact that there probably will be at least a season or you know a few weeks where there is an oversupply, he's, cause I think he's 100% right, there will be in that moment. It'll come to the market and lots of people want to profit from it because they've been stacking it for weeks or months and they'll want to sell into into the marketplace, but that'll drive the price lower. And if the dry, price goes low enough, it makes sense to then fill your coffers to whatever capacity you have. And in anticipation of like in months later, you know, in weeks or months after that sort of discount moment, there will be a lack of supply and you'll always need grain. That's probably wise, and I think I'm going to be taking that advice moving forward. Thanks, Mitch. Appreciate you. I want to read one more comment from Mitch, but I, at the same time, I want to move on. we got to get another video in here. Look at all these from the Rebellion. Ooh. Icy Flow. I appreciate you, Icy. I bet this is, I bet you're not happy. The player base isn't ready for Rebellion this year. A mini set is fine, but I don't think... This, there is any way we can release Rebellion this year with land, soul keep, infrastructure, and still unfinished. I hear the, I hear it, but I've already spoken on, on what I, I have to th say about that. But I hear, I see what you're saying. I do. And, I, and I'm not saying you're entirely wrong. I'm just saying, one, I'm excited to play it. Two, um, they need some money in their coffers. And three, if there's that diminishing sort of burn path, ultimately those who can afford it will get it. And 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 truly for not everybody needs every card in this game. I know Icy is one of those experts and he really wants to be a, a, you know, have that full modern deck. But truth is we're never gonna have every asset. And that's part of a collectible card game. Uh, okay, let's go until we get, okay, nope, different. Ah, here we go. Wrecking Ball. Let's try and grab a fuller comment. Uh, Robert Robert likes it. Mitch says this card was OP until Mavs compared it to Robo Dragon Knight. Similar stats and mana, but Robo seems stronger in my opinion. Interesting. Interesting. I almost want to go on that one. Hmm. It is a lot like Robo, but this is Bloodlust for one thing. And Robo Dragon, I don't think, has Magic Reflect. It has Archery. This is better than Robo Dragon. This Robo Dragon doesn't have self heal, doesn't have blood. This is way better than Robo Dragon. I got to quickly cover this comment, but this is just like a little taster and we'll move on to a more full comment in a minute. Robo Dragon. Am I right about that? It doesn't have magic reflect. There. Okay, on the highest level. Okay, it does have magic reflect, return fire, piercing. See, no self heal, no bloodlust. Those are gigantic differences. It has 11 mana. Now this is a dragon and the other one's a, a water. So water is going to be less versatile, less playable in fewer contexts. But, and this has the void and the divine shield. Divine shield is certainly nice, but no way, man. No, this is, yes, comparable. Okay, I'm making it sound like they're nothing alike. They are a lot alike. You're right. I'm not disagreeing with that part. I'm just saying they are substantively different. That self heal is gigantic. The other one has bigger armor, or sorry, hit points. Uh, let's. Pull that one up quickly. Is it over here? Yeah. 
got more hit points. It's got fewer armor. It doesn't have void, so it's maybe perhaps slightly weaker, but the self-heal is huge. Four hit points on the self-heal, plus, you know, you're going to bring two or three healers with the with the blue team. And that bloodless man, you're gonna you're gonna like that. And that amp damage in conjunction with these is absolutely going to proc your bloodlust. That thing is gonna kick up. In some situations, the archery damage, magic reflect damage is going to be more on one round than they're giving you. Like this thing is gonna just reverse delete this. So I'm saying over overpowered still. Although I uh, I didn't see the connection with Ro Ro Robo Dragon at first, and I will admit they are in many ways quite similar. Okay, uh, one last comment, and we'll go for with Eric over here, Eric M three nine one, and he goes, "I'm not totally sold on this one, to be honest. It's a huge hit point, self sustaining legendary water card, very very similar to Bach Jira, if you ask me. Let's look at that comparable in a minute here. I I definitely you know the big hit points of self heal. I'm seeing some of that already, but let's look at it up in a minute. If you want to give me, if you want to give Bach Jira some attack, use the free." Use the free weapons training cards. Also, you mentioned Giant Killer, and Bakhtiar can't get hit with Giant Killer. That's true. That's very true. But this can't. This card can be wiped off the board with a single hit from a Giant Killer with recharge. I think it's actually maybe two. It's not quite a single hit, uh, but y your point is still strong. I know it will be stupidly expensive to purchase this card because of scarcity, but uh, I, for one, will not be buying it. Okay. I appreciate that comment. Let's have let's pull up the box here before we go any further. There he is. So the box here has that 16 hit points. Now you don't have any armor with this guy. So but 16 hit points is a lot bigger than 13. That's one more heal per heal. First of all, second of all, it's got the void, which the which the C rec does not. Void is a huge, like a gig, a big diminishment on the damage you're receiving. The slow is very helpful, especially with the blue team. You can really create an evasiveness, and you can be you can kill your opponent before they kill you with things like, you know, either Lux Vega or even um, Kelia. And then you add slows from Bakhtiara. Maybe you put in the Supply Runner in the back lines. This is one of the teams that's very easily just outspeeds its opponent. So it's great. Bakshir is an amazing card. And he's right, six mana. First of all, six mana is far more applicable. You can play that in more context than you will ever play an 11 mana monster. Hmm. But I would say this is not going to win you a lot of matches. There's going to be one or two scenarios where this probably wins you a match. And I'm thinking poison and flight and, you know, you just out outlast them if they don't have cube. You know, this is, this isn't the carry card. It's a great tank. It's a good card. It's, it works in a lot of situations. It gets a lot of play. It's an excellent card, but I would argue that, and you know, we'll see the proof might be in the pudding. Plus maybe they nerf this stuff, especially before you, this video actually gets released. Nerfs might've happened by the time this happens. So if that's so, um, understand, I'm just looking at it from September 1st, but, uh, this absolutely could be the sort of card that wins by itself. Do you guys agree? I'm saying this is a carry card. Bakhtir is an excellent tank. It's a resilient, self-surviving. It's an excellent card. Six mana is a really good price. But I'm saying this can win games by itself in a in a 14 mana match. Drop this guy and your Kelia. And you know, this alone could be enough. If they don't come hard with crazy, like a focus damage, if they bring one archer, one melee, you know, one magic, they're in trouble because their archery and magic, or sorry, archery and melee might hit the armor, allowing you to ref reflect damage at the magic and the archery, that, and then maybe even kill them, especially in a 14 mana match like I'm proposing. You know, your opponent is gonna have, you know, a couple, I'm thinking green team right now. There's an archer for two mana. Maybe you use the dragon and you get another archer for two mana. They all the little mana monsters that might really be countering you would rel would have very few hit points. And sure, you might have some armor on them and maybe that allows them, I'm, but this potentially could play by itself in certain situations. Also, it is an excellent frontline tank. You're right, giant killer will hit this thing and hit it hard. Some of those recharges, we talked about this in the video, some of those recharges make it really vulnerable. Sudi Shaman is kicking out 
three at the highest level, which turns into nine, but 18. You're right, actually. So that's so that's 18 damage delete. Second round. Temporal Master, you're kicking out with the recharge. You potentially just do in six. That's not a big deal. The stun is interesting. Insidious Warlock, you're kicking up nine. Ifrit Rising, you're doing nine. Zyvax, you might hit the armor, which is annoying. Um, Death Blow could be could be the double damager because if I, in that one example where I said, you know, just the if you just had the C Rec, this thing's doing double damage because of the Death Blow. So you're right. The recharge gets more interesting as a result of big monsters. And so I'm not saying you're wrong about Bokjur being amazing. It is amazing. But I definitely see this ha seeing C Rec as having its own space and its own lane. This is an excellent card. And you're, but your last point, you said it would be really expensive and you're going to do without totally. That's wise. I mean, you're right. It will be expensive, especially early on. It'll probably trickle down in value unless line 1.5 just soaks up everything, which could happen. But I'm expecting this card to launch expensive and get cheaper. I'm also expecting land 1.5 to you know, soak up a lot of cards and then, you know, in the medium term price on all cards, I bet goes up. But uh, this definitely isn't going to be cheap. That's there's no two ways about that. And uh, and yet I do think it's a card that most modern players, especially the highest players, are definitely going to want. I don't think this is niche. I think this is going to be a broadly applicable. Yes, the man is high, but, you know, I, I think this is more comparable to maybe the angel over here with the Uriel. And I know this one's got recharge, but I mean, you're talking like self heal, big mana with the armor. It's doing a fair bit of damage, but really it's sustainable. It's a giant. This feels like a more comp, com more of the comparable with the self heal, the big hit points, the armor, the limited melee damage. This feels like the comparable to me. And I'm saying, you know, you're talking two bucks per bid, but this is a chaos legion. There's way more copies of Uriel than there will ever be of the C-Rec. So probably 10 bucks per copy of C-Rec after uh, probably 15 to 20 bucks on launch and then it, it'll trickle down to 10 that's that's kind of my and then if land does what it needs to you know prices come back up 20 30 percent that's that's my long-term vision with this thing thank you guys for the comments i appreciate you guys and all the support you offer the channel uh let's find out together if the audio is good and also if we get hit with a copyright strike for the music but we're going to try and keep with this, uh, with these new mixes, because uh, we were getting hit with copyright strikes previously, anyways. So let's try some good music and see what happens. And uh, thank you guys. I hope you have an amazing day. God bless.